All right, y'all. Um, great to see you again. Week two um, of our Lenten Wednesday evening art show um, and art talk. Um, we're fortunate to have Sandra back with us for a second week. Um, last week, uh, for those of you who weren't here, <clears throat> excuse me, we had a little bit of a conversation and Sandra talked to us a little bit more about kind of art in general and its role in the, in the spiritual life. And, um, and tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit more specifically about the show that we have here. Uh, as you can tell, obviously I'm here in the church tonight. I just wanted to uh, be here so that I could entice you uh, a little bit uh, more to to come and see it. Uh, we had a handful of folks here this morning to come see it. And we had a handful of folks here um, last week um, to see it. I know we for these first couple of weeks we only have I think it's Wednesdays and Fridays, but and and we're opening it on Saturdays. Um, and if you have come to see it, and then you want to come back and volunteer by just kind of working the receptionist desk uh, to hand out the booklets and. Um, and guard the art with your life, um, then we'd love for you to, to help us out with that. But uh, without further ado, I'm just going to hand it over to Sandra, who's going to talk. We're going to do the same kind of shape as we did last week. She's going to talk um, for a bit, and then we're going to do some question and answer um, at the end. So as questions come up along the way, um, don't hesitate to, to jot them down to yourself. Um, and if you don't think of anything to say, then I'll, I'll think of, I'll think I'll have plenty. Uh, it's usually not my problem. Um, okay, Sandra, over to you. I'm going to uh, pull up the, the images here. All right. And here we go. Can y'all see that? Yes. Yes. Great. Yep. Uh, I'm going to start with that tonight um, because that's the first piece I ever bought. And it's number 57 out of the Miserere series. There are 58 in it. And um, uh, the circumstances for finding this, I had a gallery owner in Connecticut who had a show of my work and she asked me to come down and talk to the gallery and also to stay at her house. Well, I found out she was Jewish and she was dying of cancer. And I noticed this piece hanging in her house and I was a little surprised. And so I asked her, I said, what about this Ruo piece? She said, oh, she says, by the way, would you buy it? My my father was in charge of the print department at Brentano's in New York City. He had a major print department, even in the department store. And uh, he gave it to me. But my children have said they will destroy it when I die. <laughs> and so that was our first purchase. I had really known about Ruo through art school, but also through Christians in the visual arts. And there wasn't there was no one in Christians in the visual arts who didn't admire Georges Rouault's work and knew that he, of the whole first, 20th, uh, first half of the 20th century, he was by far the most important religious or Christian artist of the first half of the 20th century. So with that became our first purchase. And then in, uh, and I acquired more over a period of time, but I was on the board of the Mobia, the Museum of Biblical Art in New York City. And in 2004 or five, they said that they would really like to have a show of the entire Miserere series. So my husband and I, well, I went to both Paris and London to look at some copies of these uh, suites. They actually come in a big box. And I looked through them all and I chose one um, that was from London. And then I owned all 58 plus this one. And um, there was a big show in New York City in 2006. And it was interesting. Um, the, uh, um, the New Yorker had told the Museum of Biblical Art, don't worry, we will never cover your work because of the word Bible being in your name. <laughs> but when, when the Miserere show came up, they came and they covered it. 
and they covered all the shows from that time on from New York. They thought we were going to have some cutesy sentimental work and they weren't about to lower themselves um, uh, to cover such a thing as that. But of course, uh, Mobia, um, may, I don't know how many of you knew about the Museum of Biblical Art, but they made a major difference in the art world because that museum focused on the, the um, intent of the work and what it was created for and its meaning. And um, it really helped many of the major museums to change the content of their labeling so that it just didn't have, you know, who owned it, what the materials were, but actually talked about the purpose and the intent of the work. So I'm very proud of what Mobia did and proud to have, and thankful to have been able to purchase the whole suite. And that's a different traveling show that travels uh, just of the 58 pieces from the Miserere. Why was I interested in uh, Rouault? Well, um, Number one, this piece, now let's see, what, okay, go you to the You just next tell one. me, yeah, this one? Go to the next, no, go to the next one. Okay, this one is Lord is You, I Know You. We saw this last week. And this is uh, a blind man that cannot see Christ, but he knows who Christ is. I know you, he says. And Rouault really understood that we were blind that maybe he couldn't physically see Christ, but he could know Christ's presence. And that's what this piece is about. And so I really understood that Rouault was this important artist who, who was overtly religious and yet had a modern uh, approach to things that had relevance. His Miserere series has real relevance today uh, in so many ways. And no matter what his subject was, Rouault said everything in his art was religious, be it a clown, a prostitute, a landscape. He said everything was religious. There was no distinction. Um, the other thing I want to say about Rouault, you know, he was not, he hasn't uh, fared the, the test of time. There is a resurgence in his interest in his work right now. But in 1948, when this series um, hit the market, everybody was waiting for it. Um, the Museum of Modern Art, other shows in Europe, all spontaneously happened. But um, in the 1920s, he was as important as um, Picasso and Brock. But because of the religious content of work, he certainly lost favor over a period of time. You cannot look at his work and uh, avoid the deep spiritual content. Now, galleries try to do it all the time. There was a show not awfully long ago of um, just his prostitutes that were part of many series that he did. And they played on that from a, a vantage point that Ruo would have been horrified because he saw the prostitute as a misused character um, in our culture. Um, the irony of all of his religious work is that he never got a commission until extremely late in his life. And that was for stained glass windows at the um, Notre Dame de Toute Grasse up in the Alps in France. And um, finally, near the end of his life, Pope Pius the, uh, the 12th honored him and said that he was a significant artist, but he went all of his life working alone and against the tide. Uh, France, even a bit, by the time of his death in 58, they realized that he was an important artist and uh, gave him a state funeral. And the family gave either 700 or 1,000 pieces of his art to the state, to France. Most of them are housed in the Pompidou um, in Paris. The other reason that I was interested in him, he was a printmaker. I know he was a painter, but my interest has been in his printmaking. Um, and the Miserere series and his print, prints are considered the mo some of the most, uh, well, they're monuments. They're um, to the in the whole 20th century. They're the best prints, suite of prints that perhaps has ever been created in the 20th century. 
he used uh, 10, 12 techniques in almost every piece and he reworked them and reworked them. These actually all started out with a photo impression from a watercolor or a painting that he did. And um, Villard thought that was going to be adequate, but not Rouault. And so these are um, extremely important, both for the religious subject matter, but also for the printmaking print techniques. But let's, let's know a little bit about Rouault's life. I think you can go to the next one. Yeah, it's not good. Working on it, keep going. <laughs> um, Rouault was born in the basement of his family home in 1871 during the bombardment and shelling uh, from the Paris insurrection. In fa fact, his family home was destroyed. Um, as a young boy, his aunts, he was sort of sickly, but his aunts helped him teach, taught him uh, porcelain painting. His grandfather was a collector of prints, took him throughout Paris, looking for stuff on weekends, took him to the Louvre, introduced him to the art. Um, the family needed money and at seven, at 14 years old, he was apprenticed to a stained glass maker. And that's an important thing to remember because you can look at all of his work and see how that impacted him. Um, he even worked on the restoration of the sharp windows. Um, Go to the next one, which is a head of Christ. Can you see the stained glass window impact with those black lines around him? That's one of the characteristics of his work. Um, this is an etching or an aqua tint, and it's really much more lush, luscious and luminous in person. This looks a bit faded, but he, no matter what technique he worked in, the work was really superbly done. But here, it's a likeness of Christ, but he also saw it as a likeness of all of us because we are made in the image of God. And then the next one, Golgotha, we see that same stained glass thing. Here, quite often, Rouault would portray three crosses. And the three crosses, we're not just a reference to the crucifixion to uh, itself, but that Christ is there with us um, as people. And um, there were others that died on the cross and he suffered with them. And so he, he um, this represents Christ's suffering for all, the whole world. Um, in the early just at the turn of the century, Rouault then left his work as a stained glass maker and studied with Gustave Moreau, who was a symbolist. Uh, the other person studying with him was Matisse, which is very interesting. Moreau believed in telling all of them, follow your own journey. Don't try to be like everybody else. Well, no two people could be any different than Rouault and Matisse. But uh, it was good advice from Gustave uh, Moreau's part to encourage them. In 1902, yeah, ni 1902, uh, Rouault had somewhat of a crisis in his life, perhaps a breakdown. And he looked to going to a monastery. But the, the interesting thing, the monastery he was at, that was closed. The government closed down monasteries because there was a resurgence of interest in, in church and in religious things in the early part of the 1900s, but the government didn't like it and so closed down many of the monasteries. Gustave Moreau late, later died and Rouault was made in charge of his museum. This gave Rouault a, a steady little income. Later on in 1911, uh, he met Ambrose Villard. And Ambrose Villard was this dealer, had a gallery, but he also loved publishing books. But these books all had original art. Villard is the one who in, um, had Rouault create the Miserere series and the passion. 
uh, because these were all printed as original artworks in a somewhat of a book form. Now, Villard then offered him um, a, a stipend and gave him a place to live. And he said, the deal was everything you make, I own. But Rouault was smart enough and he says, well, one caveat, you will own everything that I decide is finished. Hmm. And when I've signed my name, then you'll own it. Well, this all came to a major crisis because in 1939, Villard had a car accident and was killed. And um, the family closed the building and seized all the artwork. And he um, took a lawsuit against the family, but it took him until 19. 47, 10 years to win the lawsuit. And he won his work back. Everything, I think there was close to a thousand, 700 or a thousand pieces that were unsigned and the Miserere series. The world had been waiting, knew about the Miserere series and had been waiting for it. And so Villard, I mean, Rouault won um, ownership back of the Miserere series in 1936. 1947, Mo MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, had a huge show the very next year because they'd been waiting. Now, the interesting thing, he won all those pieces back, but there, there were many, he was older and he realized there was no way he could finish all of this work in his life. And he did not want this work left there had already been many pieces that the family had sold that he hadn't signed and he didn't want that his name attached to them. He went into the public square and he took 300 paintings and burned them publicly. Mm. That's how much he was concerned about the integrity of the work. But let's take a look now, go to this one. We'll start with the Miserere series. So we've that's a little background, but now we'll look at the Miserere series in particular. Mind you, this is probably the most important suite of artwork that was done in the 20th century for technical reasons, if nothing else. Well, Miserere means um, have mercy. And it's, he took this from Psalm 51. Have mercy upon, upon me according to your loving kindness. So the entire series you need to see is a visual plea for God's forgiveness for the whole world. Psalm 51, most of us take it to be personally, but he saw it as a plea for the whole world. The Miserere is about suffering. It's about Christ's suffering, the passion. But there is also an interplay throughout it between Christ's passion and the world. Num this is uh, Miserere number one. And here, the this is the heaven and earth. The angel is in the heavenly spheres. She has an olive branch that circles her. She looks down upon the Christ whose head is bent in suffering. Uh, it's bent with the weight and struggle of suffering. But she's also looking down on us as we struggle too. So there's always this parallelism between Christ's suffering and ours. <clears throat> you can go to the next one. So these are parallel images. This is at the front of your church. He will be in agony until the end of the earth. The interesting thing, this is a very quiet body. It's not tortured. It's at peace. But Christ will be in agony until the end of the world. In other words, as he sees sin in the world and suffering, <clears throat> he, uh, God suffers with us. <coughs> um. There are many crucifixion images in the Miserere, but always think of him in terms of Christ and in terms of uh, um, humanity. The next one, please. One of the things you will find in the Miserere and all of his work, there's always a concern for the poor. Um, he understood that Jesus had a bias toward the poor. 
This one is called Seek Refuge in Your Heart, Poor Wanderer. You know, it's a man who has nothing much other than the knapsack on his back and he's let, he has a child and somehow Ruo sees him as a wanderer, somebody who's suffering and alone. Uh, but he always sees them with compassion. The next one, I think. So this is, you had the crucifixion and then you had the wanderer. So that's the dual part. Uh, uh, um, this is another thing, another subject that, that pervades his miserere and other pieces of his work are the misuse of criminals. Um, he actually attended court, sat in court day after day, listening to what was going on and how the uh, courts, the judges, actually the church in conjunction with the judges was uh, brutal on the people. This one is um, ca called The Condemned Man Went Away. He's lonely, but Ruo sees him still a part of hu uh, humanity. The interesting thing that Ruo is thinking of, you know, Christ was also condemned. He was a condemned man too. The next one. But he didn't only look at the poor and the lonely, et cetera. He also looked pretty harshly at the, the rich, the bourgeois, and um, other kings, judges, clergy, who had all these people who had no compassion for those that had needs around them. And this is a very famous piece. The rich woman thinks she has a place reserved for her in heaven. Um, and you know, I think Rouault felt that, yeah, the church said it cared about the poor, but really it demonstrated it that care about those who had money to give to the church and um, put a higher priority on those people versus the ones who had real need of help and outreach. Another strain in the work in the Miserere is, can you go to the next one? Yes, is war. Now you may say, why is this war? Well, I pulled this up, there's many others, but this is a very interesting, um, this is called, we must die and all that is ours. This is a pregnant woman and she knows that her child, especially if it's a male, will be called to war at some point and it will be taken from her. Because, you know, Rouault lived during the First World War and he saw the ravages of war. So you'll see that, you'll see that um, even when we see the soldiers rise from the dead, they have a soldier's hats on. But you know, even in all this, in all the suffering and everything else, the Miserere series and Rouault's work is not without hope. Can you go to the next one? Um, there is light in all of his work. And I don't mean the light that you see shining on these bodies. I mean, spiritual light um, permeates everything that he does. This one is the crucifixion, but it, it was titled Love One Another. Um, you know, in other words, Christ is saying, I've died for you. I've, I've given life to you. I've given you rebirth. Love one another as I have loved you. So even in his crucifixion, he sees, he sees uh, layers that are much deeper. And in reality, that's exactly what Ruo wanted his work to be. He didn't worry about it being pretty or somebody liking it. He was digging and prodding and hoping that uh, people would see deeper than the surface layer. The next one. This is the one Zach said was dark. It is dark, but uh, it has a wonderful title. He who believes um, in me, though he be dead, shall live. I don't know how many of you have ever been in the catacombs in Paris. There are miles and miles of core, um, bones piled up on the side 
something like this. But he's saying, no, the cross is the door to the resurrection. And even though we be dead, we shall live. So here's another message of light that he, he um, intersperses in all 58 of these pieces. And then the next one, this is the uh, final piece in the Miserere series. And it's called, it is through his, we we um, his wounds, it is with his wounds we are healed. Now, this is Veronica's veil. And I think there are five times that Veronica's veil appear in the Miserere series. But, you know, Jesus is human. It's our face too. And um, his face is of suffering, but of love. And um, it's an imprint that um, was pressed against the veil and lives on. And his imprint should be in our life. Um, and Christ was, should be imprinted into our face too. And then the last one that I want to show, and it isn't quite the last, but the last of this, I, I have to end with this. This is Arise You Dead. Now he has other, one other skeleton one, but this is a marvelous one. This is um, soldiers who have died. I mean, here we are, this the first world war and you see the, the cap of the soldier. They have been buried, but he's looking forward to the resurrection. Arise you dead. And one by one, they start, the, the one to the left is lower, he's looking up, one moves up, and finally the, the one to the right raises his hand in triumph for the resurrection. It's death, but it's also resurrection. So this is the real purpose and re meaning and reason for the Miserere series. It's dark and it's a difficult suite but uh, one that's worth the effort to grasp the artist's vision and meaning. Um, I think I leave it there, but I want to, I want to just emphasize that Rouault's faith grew early in the 20th century when I mentioned there was a revival or renewed interest in the church. And many have questioned, well, did he really believe as we believe? But he said, when you read his statements, he says, I believe only in Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, he also had said at one point that I'd read that he hoped that his work would in some way lead a person to come closer to God. And uh, the interesting thing about him, he also said that my life and my art are a single whole, they're together. Um, Zach showed you this crucifixion. This is larger than some of the others. Um, the cross was essential to his faith. He said that. Um, uh, what was the quote that I just said? He, I believe only in Jesus Christ on the cross. And that's why we see the crucifixion in his pieces. But here it has beautiful color. The Miserere only shows the black and white, but his, his paintings have enormously uh, rich color. And if you see his paintings in person, they are thick impasto. It took him years, he'd go back and forth and back, and that's why he never signed them, um, is one called Sarah, that it's almost an inch thick with paint where it builds up in some areas. Um, I hope, that Rue, I want you to see that Rue O offers us hope in all the darkness. Um, take hope even, that even in a world of poverty, misfortune and war. And you know, our news is not always great every day, but there's still hope in the middle of it. And we need to grasp that um, God is present and we can, we may be blind, we can't see him in person, but we can sense his presence with us. And Ruo's message is a hundred years old, but it's still very relevant for his work, uh, even though it was conceived so long ago. So I hope that you will look at this work and see it in a new light. Um, so 
with that, I'll open you up for questions. Thanks, Sandra. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, who, uh, who has questions for Sandra? I didn't really talk about the passion. There's uh, some other suites that are there in the show, the colored ones. Mm -hmm. One is the passion and the Fleur de Mall three. Mm. Um, those were um, printed not by the same, he didn't use the same printing company, but he worked on them all himself. And until they got to the point where they were actually pulled and printed. They are remarkably luminous. So mm -hmm. I hope when you see them, you can see them with enough light to see their radiance. There's no, it's not gloom in, in those pieces, even though it's the passion that he's dealing with. And the passion certainly uh, permeates all of his work. Yeah, the colorful ones are really quite striking when you see them in person. Um, so yeah, I hope many of you get to see it. So what questions or what thoughts do you have or, or um, did one of the pieces that Sandra shared tonight particularly strike you that you'd like to talk about more or what's on your mind? We have about 20 minutes. You have to be brave and unmute yourself. I know that takes faith and courage, but be bold. Um, I have a question. I, I wonder if, so, I mean, I think that one of the things that's interesting to me and, and best to, uh, I think both in the order that you brought up some of the pieces tonight, Sandra, and in the order in which in which Rouault lays them out um, throughout the suite from one to 58, they don't seem to like follow a chronological order for, in the, for the life of Christ. And actually they're, not only do they not seem to follow that kind of order, there's, um, you know, there's images of Christ and then there's kind of peppered in all these images of peasants and prostitutes and the bourgeoisie and um, and and then and then this um, uh, Veronica, you know, the the head of Christ on the on the cloth keeps popping up kind of over and over again. So, is there any? I don't know. What insight do you have or instincts do you have about the ordering of things? Or is that intentional? What I don't know. What do you think he was up to there? Um. I just read an article today where somebody really looked at those that were listed in the, in the misery of the first half and the second half, which is gear, which is war. The, the last approximately half of it really focuses more on the war mm -hmm. and you do have more images. There's a wonderful, marvelous one about a young man who's saying goodbye to his father. And he really says, this will be the last time that we shall see each other because he knows he's going off to be killed. Um, those things seem horrible to us, but you know, during the world wars, they lived with these realities and this was around him. This is what he saw. And this is part of the suffering that he saw. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't visited the exhibition uh, the pieces that are there, are they exclusively the miserere or uh, is it a selection? Um, how is it, how was the- It's only the, about, I don't know, 12, of, 12 or so pieces from the miserere. And then there's uh, several pieces from the passion and uh, some pieces from Fleur de Mal 3 and Fleur de Mal 2 and no, Fleur de Mal 1. And that one is even a, he's done a picture of, of Satan. Um, those are rich black and white pieces again, but the passion and the Fleur de Mal three, those are colored pieces, are colored aqua tints that he did. They're smaller because mm -hmm. they were uh, just conceived smaller. So this, the images that we're going to see, uh, they were made over how great a span of time? 
Um, well, yeah, they, um, he, I think as early as 1912 or, or, or somewhere in there, did the paintings and drawings. Vallad wanted him to, so he started in on that. And um, this for the Miserere series. So they were done with photogravure. They were photographed and then um, engraving was made of them. And Vallard thought, oh, that's gonna be a simple way for me to do this, but Rouault said, no way. And uh, it took him about, about all of the 1920s to rework them. Some, sometimes as many as 12, 10, 12 different runs on something using every conceivable technique possible in etching to, to, to create the, the very interesting and um, technically intriguing surfaces. So the surfaces are rich. They're not textured, but they're very rich. I mean, so I wonder, let me years. see if I can, yeah, I wanted to see if I can, uh, well, here we go. Um, there's a couple where the, I feel like the first piece that you shared is a really good example, or this one too. I mean, if just if you look at this one for a while, you just notice there's all different kinds of lines, you know, I mean, like it's, this isn't, this isn't, uh, there's really thick lines and then really thin scratchy, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, I don't, I have none of the artistic vocabulary to describe it. Yeah, there would have been, there's just there lots of rich detail in there. There would have been strict, strictly etching. There would have been a dry point where it just scratches into the surface of the ink. There would have been sugar lift. There would have been aqua tint where he uses a powder. Um, it, there was every conceivable surface, the uh, approach to creating a surface that you could see. On this one, do you see the toning, the, the uh, brownish toning? Mm. When you go through, yeah. right here. I went through six, maybe seven suites of this work and all of them ha have, um, toning that you'd think would be disturbing, but I've learned that it's not, it's just part of it. Mm. It's part of the age, but you know, these are, are um, done in the, they were actually printed in the 1920s. Mm. So they're coming up to be a hundred years old. Mm. Mm. I, I think Any you other have- Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. You know, as I said, um, Rouault's work is not easy. You're not going to think of him as pretty, but I hope you begin to see him as profound. And um, it, it would be a sermon that was deep and rich mm. and versus one that made you feel pretty good and you went away with a smile. <laughs> but I think it's appropriate for Lent that we dig deeper and push harder to appreciate. Do you think that uh, I'm thinking about the you mentioned at the very beginning that uh, there was some show that took a selection of his prostitutes and put them with other. It, yeah. I mean, is there because that was a very popular thing, right? Especially in the late 19th century to to paint prostitutes. I'm thinking of the Impressionists, Degas, Manet, you know, I mean, they're, they're they all painted prostitutes. Uh, yeah, but because they were cheap, but Rouault painted them for a very different purpose. Yeah, and would you say, would you talk clowns. about that? Yeah, yeah he yeah. painted the clowns too in the circus. He looked at the clowns in circus as um, pretty unhappy people and that they were used by society to give pleasure to other people, but not too many people cared about them. The church certainly didn't care about them. And he felt the same way about prostitutes. Who was using the prostitutes? You know, the elite, the bourgeois, the, um, and yet the church wasn't reaching out to them. Mm. And he saw them, I think, from a very pastoral perspective. They needed to have compassion. And so his treatment of them was not to, um, uh, glorify their bodies or to glorify them, but to bring attention to the church and to others that these were people that 
the church needed to be reaching in and Christ loved them. He died for them. You know, I heard Mother Teresa um, speak once. It was one of the most um, powerful moments of my life. It was in New York City at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And she came out at the end of the service and she surprised everybody that she was there. And she was talking about the people who were drug addicts and were prostitutes and whatever. And she reminded everybody that they were made in the image of God and that they were to be loved and cared for. That was the same message that Ruol was giving. I mean, I think and I, it seems to me that uh, that is the effect of the Miserere show as you walk from beginning to end. I mean, I'm just kind of putting these things together as I'm thinking about it, but it's, it's you know, you're, you're walking from, from piece to piece and you're seeing an image of Christ and then an image of a prostitute and then an image of a clown and then an image of Christ. And, and they're all of the same style. You know, the, the, the body of Christ on the cross is, is, is dark and experienced suffering, but still has this kind of uh, dignity to it. And then and human, and, humanness, yeah, humanness, humanness, but, and, and you see the same, you know, the body of, there was the, the pregnant woman, you know, who had the, that it looks very much like the same body of Christ that you see on the cross. It's the same right. kind of lines you see there. And so it's, it's, it is the inversion of, of where can I find a cheap model I can draw, you know, it's where do I want, where can I find Christ? And he's looking to, Mm -hmm. the poor you know and those who are suffering uh is is where he's looking for I, it's a it's a yeah it's lovely amelia go ahead so <clears throat> i noticed that in all the images of christ it, um it looks like his eyes are closed um as if either he is already he's dead um or is it a a look of humility or and I haven't seen the exhibit yet so um so I was just wondering I guess whether or not you have an interpretation of that um the the other images and again I'm just trying to recall the the uh, bourgeois uh woman doesn't have her eyes closed um it doesn't seem like the the human um figures um, have their eyes closed, but again, um, well, I've never, I've never thought about that. I don't know. Um, well, both. I mean, even even this image of the blind man, even though he's blind, he just he doesn't look like he's blind. He actually looks like he's just looking down. But um, th there's not, you know. The, anyway, um, just, you know, I've uh, never. I've never thought about that, so I don't know if I could answer. What about the paint, the colored one? Well, his eyes are open here. But, he, but he's not on the cross. Um, he, he, right. So if he's on the cross, I think he would be dead. Right. So that's how he must have conceived him. Because he conceived of his suffering as his death. You know, he says, I believe only in Christ and the cross. So I think he saw the cross as his death. And um, and his entering into suffering for us. It it does seem like even um, even the human figures have their eyes closed, and um, maybe I don't know. Maybe it's just the suffering aspect of them and the the miser the misery <laughs> in their lives that they don't they don't look up. They don't. Yeah. But anyway, that's just a thought. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I, I have never thought about that particularly. There's actually three in the in the total misery. There's three women that have their heads in the air. You do notice that their head is in the air. <laughs> their head is not down. Um, but the same thing with the bishop. The same thing with a somebody with a crown on. Um, I think you you mentioned one word, humility. I think that may have that may be part of what that's pointing to too.
You know, there's a this this one. It has the same shape uh, as the as this one on the wall. That's right. Uh, back here, one. the color one. Um, but this, but the other one. I mean, the colored one has not only it, it's not just the color that makes it seem more of a hopeful version of it. I mean, but if I can get to it quickly here, like these characters, like this looks like somebody praying and this looks like, well, I guess it, this also looks like somebody praying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. These ones look <laughs> more sad to me. Uh, you know, these ones look on the right. They don't look so much like they're this, I know this is a scene of crucifixion, but this looks like a resurrected Jesus to me, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, and it seems to me like he's not hanging, he's, he's standing. Uh, yeah. And there's just more kind of... Um, Do you realize in, in, the, in the 1200s, no, in the 1100s, St. Francis cross that we looked at last week, mm -hmm. Christ was alive and mm -hmm. his eyes were wide open. It was the resurrected Christ on the cross. That was the 1100s. Then the Renaissance came because they saw that symbolically, et cetera. They weren't even trying to make it look real. They were, they were teaching theology through it. The Renaissance comes and man is the whole center of everything. Human, humanity is the center of everything. So their struggle was to how would it have looked humanly? Mm. And um, I told you, Rouault, in many ways, was a medievalist. Mm. So yeah. he's not as concerned about what it would have looked like physically. He's talking about the emotional and spiritual content of the events. Mm. I mean, I've, I know these figures, these images, um, and even that one you just showed of the inside the tomb. Oh my Lord, that's so profound to me. It's so mm -hmm. encouraging. And yet I can, perhaps I didn't think that when I first saw it, but I've come to love them and come to, to read them and, and for what they are. And they speak to me spiritually. And that's my prayer. You don't have to go away liking all of them or any, just if one or two inspire you and encourage you and the image lingers with you and um, carries its message, Rouault will have done his work. Imagine a piece of art like this a hundred years later can still be challenging somebody to think. Would you, uh, yeah, that's, that's, would you leave us, Sandra, with, um, a word or two of advice on how to stand in front of a piece of art. <laughs> I just mean when you, I mean when you're when you're in a museum or something, um, and you're kind of just scanning. When when a piece grabs you from the wall, what do you do? Like, just give us some advice for I, so here's my challenge to, to those of us who are here before Sandra leaves um come up and come up and see the show on your own um for those of you who haven't yet and um and I think it's I mean just just me sitting in here in this room surrounded by all you know 50 pieces in here or however many there are um is, is itself a different experience than seeing one image at a time on the screen you know, there's a there's the kind of way that the images play together, and then also there's just the physicalness of standing in front of it and and having letting it work on you. Yeah, um, it's a presence. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. Is that is that question make sense, Sandra? Do you have? Yeah, any it advice? does. It does. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly where I learned this, but it was about synthesis, analysis, and resynthesis. <laughs> Um, when you first see a piece, you just, if it attracts you, you go to it, you, you let it, you just enjoy it for what it is at the time. Then there's a process where you study it more, where you look deeper, where you, um, you know, a, a good exercise would be for somebody to actually have to write about one of these. Mm. I have to write 
about pieces, uh, many pieces in my collection, and I haven't even thought of them on that level. I've just responded to them sort of intuitively. Then I have to sit there and I write about the piece you suddenly see things and see connections in ways that you didn't before. And then you go back and look at it with all that perspective being drawn together. And um, after you've done that process, your level of appreciation is much deeper and richer than just uh, passing it by. I know, uh, I'm dying to get to Europe to get to the museums and see things. But there's been many, many times I've come out of a museum if I spent a day there, especially if I've gone alone. And I feel as if I've been to church. Mm -hmm. I feel as if I've worshipped. There's that uh, um, uh, fragileness I feel. Um, and that uh, many of these pieces are holy. You know, there um, it's somehow God's presence made visually to us. So that would be my prayer that even in this difficult work, there could be a piece or two that would speak and resonate and linger. Mm -hmm. um, Perfect. Um, well, I there is just as a reminder, you can um, sign up to come on the website. We have it apportioned in, in 30 minute increments, but you could sign up for more than one consecutively if you want, if you want to be there for more time. Surely it would take more than 30 minutes to, uh, to have the conversation. Um, so, so do do that. It'll be, I mean, we'll have it for a while and you'll have your opportunity, but since we're having the conversation now, um, I'd love for you to see it uh, as soon as possible. Um, but, uh, let me, on, on behalf of all of us, Sandra, say thank you. It's been a real joy uh, and privilege to have you here. Thank you so much for, for lending us the work in the first place and, and even more for sharing uh, some of your mind and, and history and story and expertise with us as well. It's a, it's a real privilege and, and delight. So thanks for being with us. Okay, well, you're all welcome and the Lord be with you. <laughs> <laughs> and also with you thanks so much sandra all right y'all i will see you next week we have i have two more special guests lined up uh, to be with us over the next couple of weeks um but uh but yeah come, come and see the show and um and and we'll we'll talk soon i'll see many of you on sunday all right okay thank you bye bye